Few sports are steeped in greater tradition than the royal and ancient game of golf. How appropriate then that the 125th Open Championship should be staged at Royal Lytham and St Anne's, a club that positively oozes tradition. With every turn, you come face to face with a legend. Lytham's open winners in their own Hall of Fame. Bobby Jones, Bobby Locke, Peter Thompson, Bob Charles, Gary Player, Tony Jacklin, and Severiana Ballesteros. It was here, in 1979, amid emotional scenes, that the swashbuckling Spaniard captured his first major title. He hasn't yet recorded. Come on, Sammy. Well done. Since then, he's won tournaments all over the world, but nothing compares to winning the Open. This is the Olympics of golf, the oldest, the biggest major championship we play. I mean, it's real golf. It's something that's special to a lot of us. You never like to read, uh, you know, he can't win the big one. That's always been my fear, is to you know, have, like, on your gravestone saying, you know, Tom Lehman, he couldn't win the big one. For such a genteel game, golf has an amazing capacity for taking its exponents through every conceivable emotion. But one thing never changes. Its legendary figures command universal respect. Oh, yes! <laughs> oh boy, American. American. He's an American pro. American pro. It was American gotcha. Bobby Jones who won Lytham's first Open in 1926. And it was from this spot that he played a miraculous mashy iron to the 17th green to set up victory. Modern American Peter Jacobson is aware of following in famous footsteps. OK, here we go. Jones crossed the Atlantic with the principal aim of winning the amateur. He failed, and so stayed on, to win the Open instead. The young whippersnapper had done it at only the second attempt, and Lytham proudly displays his winning cards. Even if close scrutiny does reveal a mysterious figure of 57 for the front line. There were obviously jokers in the pack even in those days. Jones enjoyed his many visits to Lytham, and in 1960, the club honored him, erecting a plaque to commemorate that wondrous shot all those years ago. Jones himself was typically modest about it all, but he'd left his mark, and for 70 years he has remained the only American to win an open title here. Good. Oh, it's a wonderful moment. <laughs> Tell you what, bring him in. How Jacobson would love to emulate him. It's an enduring fascination of golf that it brings together champions of past, present, and future. <clears throat> Seve's practice partner is 16-year-old compatriot Sergio Garcia. And who better to show you around than the man who's made Lytham his own? Mind you, some of the fans here this week remember little of that. Never mind, Seve. You were 16 once. The course of Lytham is something of a contradiction, a link circuit that's not next door to the sea. It's still a unique challenge, especially for Americans fed on manicured fairways and lightning quick greens. Back in the States, we hit a pitching wedge and it flies and just sticks right by its divot. But here, it, it bounces 12, 15 feet in the air and it's very difficult to adapt to that and picture a shot landing with a full pitching wedge 20 yards short of the hole and reaching it. I think in any conditions, the key, I believe, is, the, is knowing what to hit off the tee uh, to get yourself in play. I talked to the head pro here for a while when I first got here, and he said, you know, you don't need to hit it far, you just got to hit it in play. It's a massive event, and the majority of those enthralled by it are praying for a home victory. Of course, it's playing well. It's, it's nice links, firm and dry and running. You've got to land the ball at the moment, front edge, and the ball releases. So it's uh, really what we wanted, I think. And what of Colin Montgomery? He has a poor open record, and he's playing Lytham for the first time. My view is you can actually talk yourself into an early grave round here. One round, you know where not to go. Two rounds, you definitely know where not to go, and that will do me fine. 
John Daly's often said he was heading for an early grave. Now a reformed character, thanks in part to his famous victory last year. It's not as long as St. Andrews. The greens are very firm right now. Um, it's just a golf course where the fairways are really, really narrow, but there is spots to miss it. And, you know, whether you're in the rough or the fairway, you're still having to land the ball short and let it roll on because the greens are so hard. The man from Sacramento launched his defense with typical bravura. Never one for a conservative approach, he inspired the usual oohs and ahs that go with daily aggression. Liven's first seven holes yielded him four birdies. The magical touch that won the old claret jug 12 months previously had not deserted him. But Lytham is notoriously more troublesome over its closing holes, and an inward half of 39 brought the giant back to earth. A round of 70 that was to leave him three adrift. You know, it's just disappointing you get it to five under, and it's kind of been the way my year's been. And today I let a good, good opportunity get away, and, uh, but, you know, it happens. It's going to happen out here. You know, it just takes, you know, it doesn't even take a real bad shot for it to happen. For those of us of gentle disposition who don't like playing golf in sand, there are a mere 198 bunkers scattered liberally across these awesome links. It's a living nightmare. And the advice is, don't get greedy, get out. Somebody should have told Monty. The new slimline Scott has never broken par in the first round of an Open Championship in six years. And it doesn't look like he's going to start now. The damage is done. An opening 73 and a second round 74 meant he would have the weekend off. Maybe next year. It's true then. At least that's the course he grew up on. It had obviously been just one of those days for Montgomery. And it looked like being the same for Lehman when he flirted with disaster in another of those devilish sand traps that seemed to suck the ball in. But the amiable American stuck to his task. His putting stroke held up, and unlike Montgomery, he rolled the ball that vital inch further for a highly impressive 67. That's four under, and Lehman was just one of seven Americans who went to dinner on the same mark that night. Another was Mark Brooks one of the most consistent players in the pressure cooker atmosphere of the US tour. An infuriating single shot behind Daly last year, he's clearly in tune with his game this time around. Who said the Americans can't play Lynx golf? This is Mark McCumber. He talks a good game, and thoughts of an impending shoulder operation are put firmly to the back of the mind as the ball responds to its master. McCumber's four under two. And then there's Freddie Couples, one of America's favorite sons. The back's been playing him up, but the way he played today, he wouldn't know it. A little bit concerned yesterday with the way I was striking it. Uh, and I th felt like I found something on the range today and tried it for 18 holes and it worked. So it's a little unusual for me, but I really feel great about 67. And who wouldn't? Now meet Hidemichi Tanaka from Hiroshima, Japan. For the first two days, he was paired with the incomparable Seve. Intimidated? Not a bit. In fact, at one stage of the opening day, he'd achieved every golfer's ultimate ambition. He led the Open. Tanaka, on his first ever visit to Europe, said afterwards, if I had to mark every round out of 100, I'd give myself 20,000. Hmm. I think I know what he means. Whatever. Tanaka joined those seven rather better-known Americans on four under. As for Seve, well, all that pre-championship talk of Lytham inspiring him to feats of daring do rather backfired. This was the Seve of old, as he sprayed tee shots all over his beloved Lancashire Lynx. In many ways, it was reminiscent of 1979, but although the memories came flooding back, the recovery shots were few and too far between. Seve was already nine shots back. All a far cry from the good old days.
Seve in 79, and again in 1988. Gary Player, 22 years ago, winning his third Open. And Bob Charles in 1963, all Open champions at Lytham, back again this week. There's always room for nostalgia, but Jack Nicholas isn't here to reminisce. The day he doesn't come to compete, he won't come at all. Nicholas shoots 69 for starters. He's arguably the greatest player of all time, but the most successful of the modern generation is England's Nick Faldo. Yeah. The three times Open and Masters champion gets his campaign underway with a tidy 68. Not surprisingly, Faldo was the fans' pre-tournament favorite, and on the 18th, he doesn't let them down. He's as accurate and immaculate as ever. The blade of the putter, finishes the job. One round down, three to go, and our man is relatively happy. It's an accuracy goal, but you've got to, you've got to hit it in the right spot. Uh, there's so many bunkers around the greens, they can put some tight pins. You, you can't afford to miss it. The, the, the ground is so hard around the greens, it's very difficult to chip, so you just want to, you've got to play, you know, you want to get it on the middle of the green, it's the safest place. Ladies and gentlemen, the leading amateur and winner of the silver medal, Paul Broadhurst. In the year that Seve was conquering Lytham for the second time, 1988, the leading amateur was Midlander Paul Broadhurst. Now a blistering 65 to equal the course record and leave even the Americans in his wake. But can he keep them at bay? I'm surprised it's not windy. It's normally very windy around this course. I think it, it relies on wind as well. I mean, whether that's the reason the Americans are doing so well this year, I have no idea. The message is plain. The Americans have come to win, and Broadhurst can feel them breathing down his neck. But whilst Broadhurst and the rest contemplate the days ahead, others are off enjoying the entertainment just down the road on Blackpool's Golden Mile. But the Open is not the only sideshow in town. One of Lytham and St Anne's small brothers, Blackpool North Shore Golf Club, is staging the Junior Open Scholarship Tournament. The event is supported by the R&A, and youngsters from 33 countries, among them Croatia, Zambia and Russia, are competing. Proof, if it were needed, of golf's continuing development worldwide. After two days of competition, the best net score was recorded by 15-year-old Antti Hultonen from Finland. Playing off a two, another 15-year-old, Celeste Tronsperev from Paraguay, had the best gross figures. Things are going well so far. The reward for everybody? A day trip to the Open itself, to see the world's leading stars they one day hope to emulate. All, all stick together, everybody, please. And if they were lucky, they saw this, Ireland's Paul McGinley, with the perfect tee shot, a seven iron at the ninth. <laughs> Nothing to it. And anyway, he's done it before, at Muirfield in the 92 Open. Still, he was starting to get excited. That ace gave him an outward half of 29, including four birdies and an eagle. And there were more to come. This at the 17th, would put him in with a chance of a course record. Not bad for a pre-qualifier. I've always had to pre-qualify, I've never been exempt, and it's tough to pre-qualify and then come for a build yourself back up to play again during the week. Um, but I've learned from my experiences of not having played well in Opens, and I did things a little bit differently this year. On the last green, the Dubliner has this putt for a 64. Not to be but a two-round total of 134 left him with mixed emotions. 
it was disappointing. Actually, I hit a really good putt. I, I, I couldn't believe it broke as much as it did. But I've held my fair share in the last two days, so I can't be too greedy. Now here's a new kid on the block, and another from the Emerald Isle, 24-year-old Podrick Harrington. Harrington, who won the Spanish Open this year, has a big future ahead of him. He also seems to have a touch of that indefinable quality called charisma. Watch out for the name, if you can pronounce it. Podrick Harrington. Despite the Irish invasion, it was the golden bear, Nicholas, who really illuminated the second round leaderboard. This was vintage Nicholas, and heading for his lowest round in the major since his historic victory in the Masters 10 years ago. It had been far from certain that Nicholas would be here at all, and when he woke with severe back spasm on the first day of the championship, the bear could hardly get out of bed, let alone swing a club. Yet here he was, grinning rather than growling, and taming a course that could reduce lesser men to tears. Oh, not bad for an old guy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've got to be in contention if you want to have a chance to win, and uh, all I've ever asked to do is, in a tournament is have a chance to win and have my abilities uh, be used to the best uh, that I can use them. And if somebody plays better, they play better. And if I play better than somebody else, then fair enough, then I win. One young man who has started to have visions of winning is Sweden's Peter Heblon. He has won one Open before, the Moroccan Open, and today he cuts Logan's back nine down to size with 31 strokes en route to a 65. But then Lytham is at its most benign. And as Corey Pavin agrees, it's ready for the taking. Of course, has its guard down definitely with this weather like this. Uh, uh, it does make the first play easier, certainly. I think the scores are always lucky that. After 16 holes, England's Carl Mason was more than happy with his score. Eight under par and heading for glory. But Mason's been around long enough to know you can take nothing for granted in this game. The dreaded 17th struck again. And again. And again. It was to prove Mason's nemesis. Two bogeys and two triple bogeys on the same hole left him ruining shots that would cost him dear. Spare a thought, too, for the popular Australian Ian Baker Finch. The Open champion of 1991 has had little go right for him. At 20 over par, it's becoming an all too familiar story. Seve won't be with us tomorrow either. The flame seems to have gone out, at least for the moment. But the galleries don't forget what he's brought to the Open. He won't be kissing it goodbye for a long time yet. Seve, 10 over, and three shots in arrears of the pretender to his Spanish throne. For 16-year-old Garcia, it's been a learning experience. He too will be back, full of great expectations. Of four amateurs competing, only the fast-maturing Tiger Woods survives the cut to win the silver medal. I, I know that you know, I have the talent to do it, but I, I knew that I, I was rough around the edges as far as thinking goes. Um, it's one way to play at a junior level or at the amateur level and, and think your way around a golf course. Out here, if you mess up you know, one, one way or another in a couple spots, um, you're losing a lot to the field. One player determined not to mess up is Faldo. A second successive 68 left him two off the pace set earlier by McGinley. Soon that was to be matched by Lehman. At 37, the American is playing and enjoying the best golf of his life. He seems to have learned the art of getting into contention in majors, instance his runner-up spot at this year's US Open. Yeah, I think every time you're in the hunt, you, you learn something, and hopefully whatever you learn will help you just a little bit, so the next time you'll be a little bit closer. And I think my experience as a major is I've been getting closer and closer and closer. Uh, you know, I was today I felt really comfortable, you know, I'm not nervous, I'm, I'm confident, and, and I feel like that's the result of, uh, you know, previous experiences playing in major championships. 
At the halfway point, there are only two shots between the top dozen players. Just like a soldier, a golfer marches on his stomach. And Japan Shigeki Mariyama and Hidechi Tanaka are obviously eating well. They're in healthy shape, going into round three, both just four off the lead and nurturing hopes of winning a major, a feat never achieved by a Japanese golfer. But enthusiasm remains unabated. And TV Asai, who produced the television pictures, employ a team of some 130 people. Among them, one of Tokyo's leading chefs. Not that Western food is a problem for Mr. Mariyama. <laughs> he loves hamburgers. For the first two rounds, he was paired with Jack Nicholas. Playing with Nicholas was the most memorable two days in my entire life. I really appreciate the people who did the pairing. <laughs> After three rounds, the genial 26-year-old would be six under par, and like his compatriot, very much the focus of media attention. It is my great pleasure to be here, but also to have the press asking me questions is a great honor. After 54 holes, Tanaka, once eight under, had fallen victim to the treacherous back nine, losing three strokes. Neither he nor his colleague would be in the final shake-up, but how they had captivated the galleries with their golf and infectious personalities. How to play a bunker shot. Brad Faxon style. The stylish American was on his way to a 68, but that would be 10 off the pace. And here's that man McGinley again. Anything Faxon can do, so can the Irishman. But like Faxon, he goes into the last day on five under. It was to be another great white hope who would set the pace. Tom Lehman. He started out like a greyhound. This fellow is anything but a layman when it comes to golf. Another certain birdie. It was one of four in the first six holes as the American raced four shots clear of the field. Nick Faldo, looking to better his 268s, began promisingly. After dropping a shot of the fourth, he promptly eagled the sixth. You could hear the reception in Blackpool. The Masters champion had had a quiet build-up to the Open, but it was anything but quiet when he birded again at seven, and then at eight. He was within three of Lehman. Ahead, the fairy tale was fading into a pipe dream. Nicholas's putter had gone cold, and after the stylish 66 of the previous day, he slumped to a 77. At least he reserved his only birdie of the day for the fans who had gathered to pay homage in the amphitheater surrounding the 18th green. Other Americans were still in contention for a final round charge. Mark Brooks, Mark McCumber, and Fred Couples, who had closed with five fours to be seven under. Yeah. Lehman, though, was streaking clear, and after a five birdie assault on Lytham's front nine, he was four ahead of the pack, led by Falcon. 
the Americans' precision golf constantly drew gasps from an admiring audience. How come this man had never won a major? Faldo had other things on his mind. He was stalking his prey and urged on by fans willing every shot into the hole. He did his utmost to oblige. Lehman's lead was back to three. One of the best pairings of the day brought together Ernie Els and Vijay Singh. Els, rock steady over the first two rounds, would finish the day on seven under par, one fewer than Singh. The Fijian, who earns a fistful of dollars in the States every year, was heading for a level par round of 71 when he came to the 17th. That was good enough for a three. At 18, the broom handle tidied things up nicely. The elegant star from Fiji was very much in the hunt. Lehman, though, continued to edge away from the rest at the top of the leaderboard. It seemed he could do no wrong, and the commentators were drooling already about a match-winning round. He went five clear with this birdie putt of the 11th, and six ahead when he reduced the 14th to a drive, a wedge, and a single putt. Do the right club, come on. Today, every club was the right club. The field were on the ropes, or in Faldo's case, make that sound. A contortionist would have had difficulty getting out of this one, and Faldo is no Houdini. That was to cost him a double bogey, but typical of the man, he put it out of his mind and strode on down the 17th to make amends. The shot of the day. An incredible effort, and that was good enough to pull back one of those drop shots. But Lehman wasn't finished yet either. Was this a putter or a magic wand in his hand today? Eight birdies in 16 holes, and the course record looks like being smashed to smithereens. The big man has won the hearts of Lytham's knowledgeable golfing folk, no matter what happens between now and tomorrow night. To keep the battle alive, Faldo needs something special at the last. A par will clinch his place in the last day's pairing with Lehman. Exactly what he wants, though Lehman may not share the sentiment. The approach shot had been perfect. Now, the putt that would keep Faldo clinging to Lehman's shirt tails. Still, he's nine under, and Faldo knows the way Lytham is playing. It's a long way from over yet. It will get tricky because it, you know, he's going to be playing under an awful lot of pressure, thinking about winning, you know, his first major. So uh, it's going to be that sort of golf course. It's a fiddly golf course. If you lose the momentum of the, getting the right bounce, then it, it can scare you. Start looking for too many things. So, yeah, you know, I've, got, I've still got to go out and shoot a great score. That's the most important thing. The American badly wanted a storming finish to cap his day. But after drifting into one of those bunkers, he has to settle for a steady rather than spectacular finish. Thoughts of a 62 have gone, but there's an outside chance of a 63. No, but it's still a new course record, and he is six strokes clear of the field. 
the field led by one of the toughest competitors in the game, Nick Faldo. It'll be fun playing with Nick. To play head-to-head -head with Nick Faldo will be uh, uh, something I tell my grandkids about someday. And will he be telling them he won the Open? Or could somebody yet steal the title from his grasp? I feel that tomorrow is a good chance for me to learn all the things, to kind of put to use all the things that I've learned in the last few years in majors and non-majors, you know, about being patient, about playing your own game, uh, about going one shot at a time, about being committed, uh, about being confident and, and just going out and doing it. The Japanese haven't just made an impact on the course, their friendly nature and ever-smiling approach has won a legion of friends. Now the musical talents of Teramasa Hino brings an eerie atmosphere to Lytham's final green, where the drama will be played out in the coming hours. Like so many of Britain's Lynx courses, Royal Lytham owes its existence to the railway system. Founded in February 1886 on the site of the local gasworks, the only existing dwelling, the St Anne's Hotel, donated a room to the club that served both as its locker room and 19th hole. In 1890, the club organized the first professional golf event staged in England. Ten players, among them, 69-year-old Tom Morris and three other former Open champions competed for a first prize of £50. Willie Fernie, Open champion at Musselburgh in 1883, took home the spoils. In 1898, the club moved to its present site. A flourishing ladies' section developed and the Lytham layout became a firm favourite with many of the game's elite. One of them, John Ball, became an honorary member in 1908. In 1926, Lytham played host to its first Open. It was in that year the public were first charged an admission fee. Almost 11,000 people passed through the turnstiles. 70 years on, that number has risen to almost 180,000. A six-shot deficit might phase mere mortals, but if anyone could make it up, surely that man would be Faldo. After all, he'd overhauled Greg Norman's identical margin to win his third Masters green jacket only three months previously. Lehman knew that only too well. The morning papers were even predicting a day of déjà vu, but he was master of his own destiny. I think I've learned by now that uh, I can't control what the other guy does. I just need to go out and do my thing. and that, That's a nice feeling, I think, that uh, it takes some pressure off knowing I'm, I'm only in control of myself and that's all I have to worry about. But Tom Lehman has yet to win a major. Nick Faldo has won six. And so determined is he to win another, he's used his warm-up drill to simulate every shot he expects to play today. Out on the course, Greg Norman produced a shot for the connoisseurs. The first six holes had included two birdies and two bogeys, but that was for a spectacular eagle three. The shark had started the day well down the field, but promised a charge. Two holes later, yet another birdie gave the Australian a front nine of 31. But he'd given himself just too much to do. Whilst Faldo and Lehman paced around waiting for the off, a reminder that perhaps it wasn't a two-horse race after all. At the par three first, Freddie Couples had this to pull within one shot of Faldo.
couples was now eight under par. Back on the tee, more waiting. As next door, Faldo's boyhood hero, Jack Nicholas, was completing his 34th Open Championship. The Golden Bear had been unable to sustain his form of the first two rounds, but a four round total of just one over par left him and his fans in good heart. The crowds had flocked to see him. Now they switched their attentions to the main attraction. If ever Faldo needed a good start, it was now. <coughs> Be right, he said. And it was. Bang on line. A fantastic shot leaving Faldo a golden chance from eight feet. Now the spotlight switched to Lehman. This morning, before uh, when I was sitting at home, I was nervous. And I, I realized the reason I was nervous was because of what other guys could possibly do. Uh, you know, Nick Faldo could go out and shoot a good round, or, or Ernie Els, or someone like that. And I realized that you know, all I can control is what I do. And once I kind of settled on just do your own thing, you know, the nerves went away. And Lehman did his own thing. Not as good as Faldo but on the green. That's all that mattered. This was a real head-to-head, -head. just like Nicholas and Tom Watson at Turnbury in 1977, when they raced clear of the field and had to shoot it out on the last day. Watson won then. Now another Tom was in pole position. You know, starting the day, I, I just didn't feel comfortable with my swing, uh, and even worse with the putter. As well as I putted yesterday, I felt like I putted poorly today. Yesterday I had perfect speed, and, and today my speed was off the whole day. All eyes on Faldo. You really could hear a pin drop. And then, just what Faldo didn't want. His concentration broken by a fly. It could hardly have happened at a more tense moment. This to cut Lehman's lead to five. A chance had gone begging. We'll never know how much that fly affected Faldo. But Lehman still had this tester to halve the hole. This to stay six clear of the field. As you were. Ahead at the fourth, couples who tied for third once and fourth twice at the open still fancied his chances. This fearless approach set him up for another birdie, and the putt that followed brought him level with Faldo at nine under. Yeah. Faldo and Lehman both parred the second, and the American stood on the third tee, happy to have kept distance between himself and his principal rival. He'd parred the hole on all three previous days, but knew there were plenty of potential hazards away in the distance. You hit it in those bunkers, uh, you're thinking that you know, it's a potential double bogey you know, because you have a hard shot coming in now for your third and you miss the green and you know, it's a possible six. In fact, Lehman escaped with a bogey five. He'd lost one stroke to the field. Things were warming up and with no great wind to test the best, the golf was equally scorching. Couples at the fifth. He was now ten under par. The battle was well and truly joined, and Mark Brooks was next to get the crowd roaring in admiration. And almost disbelief. It was St Andrews all over again for Brooks. 
He too went to 10 under with 14 holes still to play. Lehman though, still led by four, and Faldo, without doing much wrong, had slipped to fourth. Faldo wanted for nothing, from tea to green. The question was, when would he start to convert his chances? Nick can be a very intimidating player just by the way he plays. He hits so many good golf shots, and uh, you get the feeling that he's never going to miss. You could say the same for couples. This to draw within two of his fellow American. This for an eagle at the sixth. No, but he was getting closer. Back on the fourth, the noise told Lehman something was up. But his immediate concern was Faldo. Uh, it kind of makes you feel pretty inadequate at times. So I, I chose to try to not pay as much attention to him as, as I might otherwise. Just, you know, don't watch him hit it, don't watch him swing. Get it. Get it. Get it. But he couldn't get around the fact that Faldo was now getting in on the act too. Spurred on by an English crowd, that had seen Tony Jacklin win his open crown at Lytham 27 years before, Faldo sent his tee shot at the fifth, a par three, measuring 212 yards, arrowing to within whispering distance of the hole. It was a wonderful chance for Faldo to turn the screw on the leader. The crowd cleared their throats, ready to roar again. Maybe he wrapped it a fraction too hard. Either way, Lehman, who got his three, breathed a sigh of relief. Faldo knew he'd missed a golden opportunity. And so to the sixth, the first of Lytham's par fives. Well, the sixth hole, uh, we thought we could probably just fly it over the corner and it hit my drive pretty solid. But I hooked it a bit, pulled it a little bit, and it ended up in the bushes, which I was kind of surprised about. Surprised, but ultimately fortunate. He had at least some kind of a shot. It was time for some positive thinking, some good old-fashioned common sense, and some good course management. The American settled for just getting the ball out. And he was rewarded. Two shots later, he'd found the green. And that, summed up, left him with a chance of salvaging a priceless par. An adventurous five it is. But Faldo is on in three. He has a little tiddler for his birdie. Yesterday, he holed a long eagle putt here to stay in touch. Surely he wouldn't miss this two and a half footer. <laughs> yes, he would. It was the sort of error that drives golfers mad. These were crucial holes, and Lehman was really hanging on. At the seventh, the longest of Lytham's par fives, Faldo again raised the spirits of the masses. He was on in three. Could he convert the putt this time? No, he could not. Yeah, I could tell he started losing confidence with his putter. After that, he didn't really stroke the ball all that well from then on. And, uh, you know, if you can make a few early, you know, you get some rhythm going with your putting, you know, it could have been a different story. If the leaders were struggling to make birdies, there was no shortage elsewhere. Mark McCumber entered the equation with a run of 14 holes in which he shot nothing higher than a four. Ernie Ells too was on a roll. Three birdies around the turn, including this at the tenth. We're on the run in now. Layman's overnight advantage has been halved 
and the field is still closing in. At 12, and then 13, the South African chips his way to 12 under, just two adrift of the lead. And Faldo, for all his trials and tribulations, isn't finished yet. A birdie putt at nine. You know, it's easy to see why he's won so many major championships the way he plays golf. You know, so when you have his kind of uh, swing and his kind of heart, uh, it's a pretty tough combination. The pressure was no doubt building on the American. After 11 holes, he dropped a shot and hadn't had a single birdie to celebrate. He needed a break. The turning point was the 12th hole. Um, and I felt like the front nine, I really struggled. 10-11, uh, I started to feel more comfortable. Then 12, I hit just the best shot of the week on was a four iron, uh, just 12 feet right of the hole. It was exactly what the doctor ordered. I made that putt for birdie, and it really seemed to give me a big lift. Lehman had given himself a cushion again. But still that name, Ells, wouldn't go away. Having taken the US Open two years ago, the South African is eager to land a second major before he gets much older. And with this sort of play, that's inevitable. His mood has improved with every passing shot. And victory? Well, it's not impossible. Nor does McCumber feel he's out of it as he comes towards the end of four very good days' work with a par at the 17th. He needs just one more for a round of 66, which could be good enough. But Couples has called it quits. And so too has Mark Brooks. A litter of drop shots on the back nine has undone all their early good work. It's now down to three. Lehman, Faldo, and Els. But at 16, calamity looms for the South African. A pulled tee shot. An unwanted bunker shot. And eventually, a 10 footer to save par. But just when he most needed a birdie, he takes bogey. But it's not over yet. Lehman has bogeyed the 14th, so there's still a chance for his closest pursuers. But the pressure is beginning to tell, and Faldo, it seems, is the first to buckle. A bogey at 15 means only Els can mount a realistic challenge. But suddenly he's out of kilter, in real trouble, off the 18th tee. Right. Into the bunker. McCumber is about to run out too, but has this for a 65. Not to be. But he got his 66. He's 11 under par and leader in the conference. Back down the fairway, the changing fortunes of Ernie Els. He's a magnificent bunker player. Now he needs to show it. Cometh the hour, cometh disaster. The ball has traveled only a few yards. With it has gone any hope Els may have had of the title. Couples round is typified by his final putt. A back nine of 41 strokes leaves him contemplating yet another major championship to have eluded him. Els gets his five, but he was only interested in a three. He too must reflect on wasted opportunities. He was philosophical after signing for a 67. When I walked onto the to the green at 17, uh, I saw, I looked at the leaderboard and Tom was still 15, I must have changed it as I put it. Um, but I knew, I knew I had to make the putt, I wanted to get to 14, 
Uh, as it turned out, yeah, I, I had two bad shots, you know, an 18, a drive on 18, and a tee shot at 16, and that cost me the, the tournament, I guess. That left the stage to the final pairing of the day. The only players still out on the course, but only one of them was thinking of glory. Lehman just had to play it straight to win. A par four would do nicely. A bogey five would be good enough. And even as his tee shot skipped and bounded along, another master craftsman was hard at work. I saw that I had a two shot lead and in fact, just keep it out of those little nasty pot bunkers and see my get up there on the green. Uh, you know, I knew the thing would be mine. It was a pretty safe bet it would be. It was a killer blow. Lehman was on the verge of his first major. The walking up the, the 18th, you know, you know, watching on television all those years and seeing the, you know, the winning player walk up the 18th fairway and fight his way through the crowd and you know, the big ovation from the grandstands and to have that actually be for you is, it was just thrilling. You know, it puts, um, tingles up and down your spine and makes you want to cry. And I had tears in my eyes as walking up, the, up to the green and, and then Nick walked by and slapped me in the back and you know, said, well played, you, you deserved it. And, and uh, you know, it was just a great experience. All he had to do was lay it up. That'll do nicely. It's not often Nick Faldo is cast in the role of supporting act, but those missed chances over the opening holes left him with a bit point and ensured there would be no repeat of his heroics at Augusta. Faldo's closing 70 left him in fourth place. The title had slipped away. About to be seized by a 37-year-old American. A marvellous moment for a player coming of age. Tom Lehman's first major title, and the one he'll cherish most, no matter how many more he wins. It again evoked memories of the only other American to win the Open Championship at Lytham 70 years ago, Bobby Jones. His four-round total had been 291. Now Lehman had shattered the Open record for Lytham with 271 and was ready to receive his reward. And the champion golfer for the year with a score of 271, Tom Lehman. I'm not really sure what to say. It's uh, such an unbelievable experience to, to have come really so far and, and to come here at, to roll with them and, and win this uh, greatest championship in the world uh, against the greatest field in the world. That field had been eclipsed. Tom Lehman is no longer the nearly man of golf. His name can be added to Lytham's Hall of Fame. Open champion, 1996. You know, you never like to read, you know, that, uh, you know, he can't win the big one. That's always been my fear is, is to, you know, have like on your gravestone saying, you know, Tom Lehman, he couldn't win the big one. Today wasn't pretty, but, but it was, it was good enough. Yeah.